Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this video on international supply chains. Uh, what we're going to do is tackle two major questions for this video. Uh, so first, just establishing what a supply chain is exactly. Uh, and then we are going to go on and look at the globalization of modern supply chains, uh, as well as a couple of uh, critical perspectives. So if we start with the question of what supply chain is, uh, well, it's both a very complex and a very simple answer. Uh, so the best way to think about supply chains uh, is that it's the movement and processing of raw materials uh, down uh, usually a chain of different sets of activities uh, until they get to the end consumer. Uh, so the start of a supply chain will be with the ultimate raw materials. So if we think about something uh, like a, a can of coke, uh, the raw materials will be the aluminium that makes up the can, uh, as well as the water, the flavorings, the sugar, so all of the, the ultimate raw ingredients and raw materials uh, moving down a set of activities, usually in different locations and also with uh, many different companies involved uh, until it's processed into refined forms. Uh, it's assembled together, it's bottled into the actual can itself uh, and then moving across again a, a different set of activities, different warehouses, different logistics networks uh, until it ends up in the hands of the consumer. Uh, it is important to note this, the distinction between consumer and customer. So because there's multiple different companies uh, involved in any given supply chain, uh, each company is a customer from the company that precedes it in the supply chain. Uh, so, for example, the uh, the customers of the... Uh, uh, the, the farm that grows the sugar cane may well be a, a sugar cane processing company. They're a customer. Uh, the customer of a wholesaler, which actually stocks the can of Coke, uh, will be the retailer that buys the, the, the cans from them wholesale. Uh, but most products and, and certainly services have only a single consumer, and that's the person that actually uses the good or service as intended. Um, so multiple customers, but only, generally speaking, a single consumer. So everything from the raw materials moving down to the consumer themselves, um, that con con consists of the supply chain, that is the, the, the supply chain as a whole. Uh, and supply chain management is simply the act of or the function of, of managing this complex web of companies uh, in order to align all of them and, and to get all of the activities functioning uh, in concert in order to produce these products and services uh, that are ultimately sold to the consumer. So what we can't think of is uh, that a uh, given product or service uh, is the sole result of sing simply a single company. Uh, so when you consider a can of Coke, it's not just the product of a single company, the Coca-Cola Corporation, uh, but it is, in fact, uh, a combination of, of lots of different companies as well as individuals uh, involved uh, in actually bringing that product uh, ultimately into, into your hands when you purchase and, and drink a can of Coke. Um, so a good way to think about modern business, especially on a, uh, on a more conceptual scale, uh, is groups of supply chains competing against each other. Uh, but also the complexity of, of modern competi uh, competition means that uh, you will have some competitors such as Apple and Samsung uh, who are also involved in each other's supply chain. So Samsung is both a competitor uh, for Apple in uh, both the laptop space as well as the mobile space. Um, but uh, Apple is also an important customer for Samsung. Uh, Samsung is very much part of Apple's supply chain. So what we have here is really a, a distinct set of activities involved uh, in any given supply chain. Uh, so it's not just purchasing. So we do have lots of procurement activities uh, occurring within a supply chain. Uh, you also have operational activities. So things are processed, they're manufactured. Uh, you also have lots of logistics. Uh, uh, items, ingredients, uh, materials need to be moved from one place to another. 
uh, as well as the finished goods or part finished goods also need to be moved from one location to another uh, and then marketing and sales are very much involved in uh, in the supply chain management side uh, pulling information both up and downstream uh, so that's our understanding of what a supply chain is exactly uh, but in terms of how globalized modern supply chains are, uh, well, the answer is uh, massively globalized. Uh, so if we consider here, this is a uh, typical electronics product supply chain. This is fits a, a huge range of mobile phones, uh, smartphones, watches, uh, laptops, computers. Uh, so lots of pretty much any kind of modern electronics products. Uh, will have huge global supply chains. Uh, so we see there the DRC, uh, which produces cobalt and other minerals, which are essential in the production of pretty much any uh, electronics uh, electronic product today. Uh, we have various other uh, uh, raw materials from rubber and tin uh, uh, to uh, aluminium, different types of metals. Uh, we have lots of assembly which takes place in China, but it would be a mistake to say uh, that these products are made in China. Uh, that implies they go from raw materials to finished product within China, which is simply not the case. Uh, so we actually need to think of these as global products. Uh, the final assembly occurs in China, uh, but part assembly, part manufacturing and certainly raw materials uh, come from a huge range of places. Um, and even when the product is finished, it's not just shipped to the final location and to the retailer. Uh, it'll often go to uh, logistic centers in various continents. So if you purchase something uh, in, say, Spain, uh, it's, it's quite likely that the logistic center uh, is going to be somewhere like perhaps Italy or, or Germany before it, it gets you know, passed on then uh, and moved to uh, a national distribution center in Spain, uh, then a regional center uh, and then through perhaps multiple links, finally ending up at your final location. Um, so it, it is generally a huge complex global supply chain uh, to produce uh, any given electronic product. Uh, it is worth saying that uh, this is the case not just for complex products um, like uh, electronics and, and other high-tech products uh, but pretty much any product today from the, the simplest products uh, there is usually some kind of fairly complex uh, and heavily globalized process involved uh, so if we go from uh, uh, you know a, a smartphone and we go all the way across to something nice and simple uh, like Nutella, so chocolate spread or, or some kind of chocolate food product. Uh, and we see that actually, uh, even with this, there is a huge globalized supply chain uh, behind something like Nutella. Uh, so hazelnuts from uh, Turkey, uh, palm oil from Papua New Guinea, uh, cocoa from the Ivory Coast, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, cocoa from Ecuador, vanilla from the US, so a huge range of uh, of different global suppliers, uh, different manufacturing centers spread out across different co uh, continents, uh, and then a, a huge complex um, uh, logistics network to, to move the, the actual part finished and, and fully finished product uh, around the world today. Um, so something which seems to be relatively simple it's a food product you may think that actually this is largely produced in in within the certain region uh, or if you're purchasing nutella you may think well is is, is going to be uh, manufactured in a, a single uh, continent so perhaps in europe uh, but it, it really is truly distributed global uh, 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 supply chain uh, for the seemingly simple straightforward product uh, so massively globalized supply chains for pretty much everything. Uh, if we actually turn our attention now and look at aggregate supply chains, so what we have here now uh, on the screen is a, uh, a, a intensity map for global shipping. So the vast majority of goods today in supply chains uh, still move through uh, in terms of, uh, of massive shipping containers um, for a simple reason uh, that to justify air freight you need a very high value to weight ratio whereas shipping can still 
uh, accommodate uh, far lower value to weight ratios. Uh, so the vast majority of goods today uh, do move through freight shipping rather than air freight or, or train freight. So it's uh, the most common form of, uh, of logistics movement today. Um, and then one thing that should be very clear is that despite the, the massive globalized nature uh, of modern supply chains, there's still clear intensity or greater intensity in some routes than others. Uh, and this helps us actually understand how the movement of goods and services around the world today, as well as raw materials uh, uh, and other uh, commodities, uh, really sheds light on some, some key uh, political, cultural and even social issues. Uh, so if we identify three distinct uh, choke points where uh, a huge intensity of, of shipping passes through relatively narrow areas, um, and it does help us understand some of the uh, some of the things that may stand out in terms of geopolitics today. Uh, so the first would be the Panama Canal. So the Panama Canal isn't a, a natural waterway, but rather it's an artificial waterway uh, running through the country of Panama in Central America. Uh, and it marks an ability for uh, shipping freight to bisect the continent or, or the two continents of North and South America. Uh, so to uh, avoid the necessity of traveling all the way around uh, South America or all the way uh, north and, and into the Arctic and back down North America. So massively vital uh, for goods to be able to bisect this. Simply shipping something from, let's say, Los Angeles to New York. Uh, via sea would be uh, far more expensive and costly and timely if it wasn't for uh, the Panama Canal. Uh, and the same goes for shipping something from, uh, say, uh, Peru uh, across to Venezuela as well, or Chile across to Venezuela as well. Uh, so it, it really is a vital waterway and it's a massive route for a huge amount of uh, the world's global supply chains. It also helps explain why the U.S. has uh, at least once directly invaded and occupied Panama and remains deeply involved in uh, in, in Panama's uh, politics and, and, and internal power distributions. Uh, also explains the Monroe Doctrine or helps give context to the Monroe Doctrine uh, and the uh, American involvement in Latin American affairs. Uh, so it is impossible to understand some of the geopolitics of the region without understanding the role that international trade uh, and particularly global supply chains play. Uh, we have an even more dramatic example really with the Suez Canal. So just like the Panama Canal, the Suez Canal uh, in this case um, allows for a, a way through uh, between Africa and Asia Minor. So it passes through uh, Egypt as an artificial canal and allows you to go from the Mediterranean Sea uh, into the uh, the Arabian Gulf and then on to the Indian Ocean as well. Uh, so without the Suez Canal, uh, if you had shipping going from, say, China to Europe, it would be forced to go around uh, South Africa, uh, the, 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 the Cape uh, uh, itself, and then back up uh, through West Africa and then eventually on to Europe. Uh, a very long and, and costly journey. Whereas with the Suez Canal, shipping can go from uh, the coast of China uh, around uh, 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 the Indian Ocean and then straight through e Egypt and, and into the Mediterranean. Uh, so a huge amount of international trade passes through the Suez Canal, uh, not just uh, finished manufactured products from China, uh, but also a huge amount of oil and other resources as well. Uh, so oil reserves, not oil reserves, sorry, but uh, oil itself, crude oil and, and, and processed oil uh, would have to otherwise go again uh, around the Cape of South Africa uh, and then back up if it wasn't for the ability to access the Mediterranean uh, through the Suez. Um, explains why again with the Suez War where France uh, and Britain and, and Israel invaded and, and briefly occupied the Suez Canal uh, in Egypt um, explains a lot of the, the geopolitics of the region as well or at least gives significant context to the region uh, and in a similar sense the Gulf of Aden uh, which is the uh, tiny kind of uh, waterway that goes between uh, Africa and uh, Yemen, uh, named after the, the port city of Aden in, in Yemen. 
uh, as well as more broadly the the coast of Somalia. So if you've uh, heard about Somali pirates over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, well, the reason why uh, piracy off the coast of Somalia is treated so seriously and has such a high profile uh, is because it's threatening uh, really massively significant global supply chain uh, shipping routes. Uh, so Somalia, uh, just off the coast of Somalia, you have a huge proportion of uh, Finnish goods heading to Europe from uh, factories and, and, and producers in, in Asia, particularly in China. Uh, you have a, a significant amount of oil tankers passing through as well on the way to and from the Mediterranean uh, and a huge proportion of the world's wealth in terms of uh, uh, products and services moving through global supply chains uh, moves across uh, very close to, to, to the coastline of Somalia. Uh, so again, some, some context as to, to why the, uh, <clears throat> the issue of piracy of the coast of Somalia uh, is given such uh, such huge global media attention and, and international uh, efforts uh, uh, to act against it. Uh, and another thing that this map really should do to to kind of bring out is the fact that um, despite this sense of increasing interconnectedness, we are able to jump on a plane and, and arrive in Australia after you know just fourteen hours. Uh, instead of taking uh, six months to travel to Australia, uh, we're able to communicate almost instantly with, with pr pretty much anywhere in the world as long as there's some form of, of internet access. Um, the world is still a very big physical place. Uh, moving goods, <clears throat> components and, and materials uh, from one place to another place in the world is, is still a complex endeavour. It still comes with a huge range of, of physical risks. Uh, and there is still huge distances involved. Uh, so we should be mindful of this when it appears to be, you know, the ability to send an email to China or pick up a phone to, to someone in India uh, and to strike a business deal seems very easy. We forget, you know, just how physically big the world is and just how vast uh, the distances involved actually are. Uh, now, we're just going to look at a few other maps that, that may kind of shed light on, on some common issues or some some increasing trends uh, so the first would be the increasing intensity of uh, of world trade and the increasing importance of global supply chain so the trend line is very clear uh, we're not moving towards um <clears throat> you know a, a a a step away from from international and global supply chains but rather the opposite be interesting to see how coronavirus uh, the coronavirus pandemic may affect this uh, but if you see here the, the 20, 21 odd years between 1990 and 2011, uh, we saw a, a rapid increase in the proportion of world trade, uh, world trade as a share of world GDP. Uh, so increasing uh, intensity of world trade, increasing intensity of integration uh, into the, the global economic system is, is quite clearly the trend line that's occurring. Um, we did say that coronavirus may well impact this, and, and this is true. So I just thought this map was particularly interesting. Uh, so this is just showing the share of, uh, of in, uh, import of intermediate products coming from China uh, and how that's distributed around the world. Uh, so in this case, the lighter yellow, uh, it is the, the lower the, the percentage and the darker yellow, you get up to very high percentages. Uh, so we can see in the US, for example, up to 35% uh, or so up to 30% of uh, intermediary products are directly taken from China. So that's a huge proportion of products that are coming in from supply chains, uh, uh, supply chains to the US from China. Uh, and that's generally the trend across all major economies. So from Western Europe to India, Brazil, uh, South America, Turkey all showing increasing levels of, of supply chain of China. And, and this quite simply creates a significant vulnerability within a lot of global supply chains today. So the heavy reliance on China uh, as a place for final assembly, particularly electronics assembly, as well as uh, various uh, other component manufacturing uh, elements, uh, means that there is a, a huge uh, reliance on China. So any disruption to global supply chains, as we saw with the coronavirus, could have uh, really significant knock-on effects.
Now, just the the last map that we're going to look at on this video uh, is is one supplied by BSI, um, so uh, an analysis company uh, which is focusing on what they call supply chain terrorism. Uh, now, I have a, a major problem with the the term terrorism. I think it's functionally meaningless in in many contexts, and uh, this is easily supported just by trying to find. Um, any generally applicable definition which isn't extremely narrowly defined uh, it's a really tricky term uh, but in this case we can forgive bsi's use of this uh, simply because it sheds light on on a really interesting and an important trend uh, and that is of violent disruption to various supply chains it's it's a trend that's been increasing uh, over the last uh, decade or so uh, and because of our, our massively increasing reliance on global supply chains um, it's one that's a, a really serious problem or, or potential problem. Uh, so there are a few things uh, that we can pull out from this. Uh, firstly that uh, causing disruption to let's say uh, societies in the global north uh, simply doesn't require being physically present in the global north. Um, significant disruption can be caused uh, simply because supply chains stretch all across the world uh, and vitally important supply chain activities are very much commonly located in the global south. Um, so that's one thing to, to understand and that would be, I guess, the justification for calling this terrorism. Uh, although, again, I've, I'm deeply sceptical of, of how useful that term actually is. Um, and secondly, I can see that disruption to global supply chains uh, is something which uh, can have huge knock-on ramifications uh, for countries well outside uh, either the country where uh, the, the violence occurs uh, or indeed uh, neighbouring countries uh, uh, to, to where the violence occurs. Um, that uh, an attack on a in a, in a coal mine in, in Pakistan or in China uh, could potentially have ramifications, much wider ramifications uh, than just in, in Pakistan and China. Uh, so this is something which is not necessarily uh, hugely highlighted in the media. Uh, it's not particularly dramatic and often the, the impacts are not dramatic impacts. They, they can snowball and have significant impacts, but it's not a case of uh, an attack which occurs on Monday and then on Tuesday products disappear off the shelves. Uh, it's far uh, as a longer term, more involved process than that. Uh, so it is not particularly high profile. It's not something which is often reported on, uh, but it is an increasing vulnerability uh, and inc there is an increasing awareness of the impacts this can and, and does have on, on various supply chains. So it does lead us into our, our final thought here, which is a recommendation for further reading uh, if you're interested in some critical perspectives on supply chains, uh, particularly in understanding how supply chains um, actually are, are one of the, the primary movers in, in how our world actually operates. So uh, Naomi Klein, the, the book on the left here, This Changes Everything, is uh, I think quite readily available. It's also a very good documentary. Uh, that was adapted from the book itself uh, takes a uh, long-term sustainable understanding of how modern capitalism and modern day supply chains operate uh, and whether this system of very efficient uh, global uh, production and consumption is really uh, in any meaningful way sustainable. So not just the headline thing, so the fact that a huge number of uh, flowers are grown in East Africa and then imported to countries in Northern Europe, such as the UK, um, but also the general logic of this cycle of production and consumption. Uh, and secondly, uh, I thought a, a really wonderful book is The Deadly Life of Logistics uh, by Deborah Cohen. Uh, so this is looking at the uh, various ways that violence manifests itself uh, within logistics networks and global supply chains. Um, so not just looking at violent attacks or what the previous slide uh, we saw labelled as supply chain terrorism, uh, but also the way that supply chains exert violence on, uh, on the communities in which they're situated. So understanding that the primary ways 
uh, that the global economic system actually manifests itself in communities in the global south it is through supply chains uh, and through the uh, the positioning of various parts of the supply chain uh, within communities in the global south uh, and this relationship is often marked by 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 significant amounts of violence uh, so understanding this violence uh, in the context of global trade